Area Center. And we're happy to be hosting this webinar today with MPA News, a service of Octo, with the EBM Tools Network, which is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe, and with Open Channels, a service of Octo. So with us today is John McDonough with NOAA's Office of Marine and Aviation Operations, who will be giving a presentation on unmanned systems, transforming how we study and manage the marine environment. Thanks to John for sharing this work with our audience. I'll introduce John in a moment, but first I want to remind you all that this is an hour long webinar. We'll have the presentations and then allow plenty of time for questions and comments. So please use the chat or the Q&A functions in your webinar interface to provide your questions so that we can have a conversation about these ideas following the presentation. So we're very happy to finally introduce our speaker. I believe with scheduling difficulties as well as a federal government shutdown, this is the third time we've had John on the schedule. So John, it's great to have you with us today. John McDonough joined NOAA's Office of Marine and Aviation Operations or OMAO in January 2017 to develop a framework and process to identify, develop, test, evaluate, and transition advanced technologies that support the NOAA mission and are compatible with the office's operational mission. This includes unmanned technologies that meet multiple NOAA mission requirements and could be transitioned to become a core capability provided by this office. Before joining OMAO, John served as the Deputy Director of the NOAA Office of Ocean Exploration and Research, where he planned and executed collaborative ocean exploration campaigns with federal agencies, nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, and industry, both nationally and internationally. He has served, sorry, worked extensively with OMAO throughout his career and has been engaged in several NOAA ship conversions most notably the conversion of the U.S. Navy capable to the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. John has served as a member of the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program Senior Management Council, served as the NOAA representative on the Executive Committee of the Interagency Extended Continental Shelf Mapping Task Force, established an ongoing partnership between NOAA, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and the U.S. Geological Survey to conduct baseline characterizations of previously unknown marine areas in the Gulf of Mexico and Mid-Atlantic Bight. In collaboration with NOAA Fisheries and NOAA's National Ocean Service, John has helped establish the NOAA Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program. So again, welcome to John, and I'll now turn the presentation over so that we can begin our webinar. All right, thank you, Roldan, and thank you to the MPA Center and sponsors for inviting me to talk with you today about unmanned systems and how the technology is proving invaluable to NOAA as another tool to meet our mission requirements. Uh, it's certainly an interesting and exciting topic, and there are a lot of opportunities I think we can take advantage of, especially since the technology continues to evolve very rapidly. Uh, however, there's many considerations that must be taken into account to ensure success. Here's a brief overview of what I'll be covering. I'll provide some general comments on how unmanned systems can help meet NOAA mission requirements and how they currently are. I'll go over some of the systems we've been using for the past few decades, including unmanned aerial and marine systems. I'll discuss how unmanned systems can be used where traditional methods of collecting data may not work, and provide some examples about how these systems may support MPA management. And finally, I'll conclude with a brief look ahead, focusing on trends that we're seeing, requirements we may benefit from, as well as things that we must consider. So as I mentioned, NOAA has been experimenting and working with a variety of unmanned systems for decades. Uh, they're used to augment the data we collect through traditional techniques, manned ships, manned aircraft. And for example, the National Marine Fisheries Service has been and will continue to use unmanned systems to collect information that's critical for conducting stock assessments and providing data from, for um, uh, difficult to survey areas, collecting oceanographic data to better understand species distributions, conducting ecosystem and habitat assessments and identifying essential fish habitat, as well as a variety of marine mammal surveys, uh, bird surveys, and surveys of other species. And with regard to mapping, unmanned systems are proving to be very proficient for conducting hydrographic surveys and updating our NOAA chart products, mapping and delineating habitat at multiple scales, and in sonifying the water column, which can be extremely important for understanding how pelagic species function in response to their environment, 
as well as to identify ocean bottom vents and better understand their role in the global carbon uh, cycle. There's a lot of exciting work going on here. We're also seeing that unmanned systems are being used along with ships and aircraft to meet mission requirements of the National Weather Service, including improving our understanding of and ability to forecast severe weather events, determine how air pollution may damage forests, crops, and aquatic ecosystems, and providing data critical for improving river and flood forecasts, as well as water supply forecasts. And of course, unmanned systems are providing to be very useful for increasing the pace of ocean exploration, identifying and pro providing baseline characterizations of habitats, areas we've never seen before, understanding the health of habitats and how they may change over time, and monitoring water quality, for example, monitoring the extent and duration of hypoxic zones in the marine environment. Gulf of Mexico is an excellent example of that. So a little bit about the platforms. What types of platforms are available? What are the programs using? Well, they're using everything from large and small scale unmanned aerial systems to a wide variety of marine systems. So let's take a look at a few of these. With regard to unmanned aerial systems, they do play a very important role along with manned aircraft in providing knowing our partners the ability to improve our understanding of the atmosphere from the space to the surface of the oceans, and even a bit below the surface. NOAA has been conducting research on the capabilities of these systems to deliver mission critical information at high, medium, and low altitudes. And we're certainly gonna to continue to see that accelerate in the future. Give you a couple examples. So for instance, through a significant public-private partnership, NOAA used the Northrop Grumman Global Hawk to determine the role it could play in delivering information to improve hurricane track and intensity forecasting in the advent of a loss of satellite capabilities. Although there are no current plans to transition this technology to full operations, I'd say the experiment, it was a multi-year experiment, was fairly successful. And this is the not, the, it's not the last that we're gonna see of these types of vehicles. Expect us to be moving on uh, pretty rapidly in the future. Now, NOAA also has been experimenting with a variety of mid-altitude unmanned aerial systems, both launched from shore as well as from ships, to support a variety of missions, including marine mammal surveys and severe weather forecasting. But one of the things that's interesting and we're witnessing is a very significant increase of the use of drones. And so these are the small systems that I think most of you are familiar with. They're available, you can pick them up at Best Buy, you can pick them up through Amazon and other vendors. And they are proving useful to support a variety of research projects and are definitely being used more and more often by MPA employees, uh, basically to increase our situational awareness of the areas that they manage. So unmanned marine systems, well, these are also play, proving to play a significant role in increasing our presence on and under the ocean from the surface of the ocean to the sea floor. And we're witnessing an increase in integrated operations where unmanned marine systems are used in tandem with traditional techniques, providing context and a much more comprehensive view of the areas we study. Quite often we're seeing integrated operations that include ships, unmanned aircraft, unmanned marine systems, and data being collected by buoys and other types of instruments offshore. So it's a pretty interesting environment that we're dealing with there and the technologies are just fascinating. So a little bit about unmanned surface vehicles. Uh, we've been using these for quite some time, both powered and self-propelled, self-propelled by wind and solar energy, to supplement hydrographic and habitat mapping. And I suspect these are gonna continue to play a significant role as we engage the Nippon Foundation and JEPCO Seabed 2030 initiative. Uh, this is a, a main initiative which aims to map the global ocean at a resolution of about 100 to 200 meters. Keeps changing a little bit by, by 2030. And these vehicles, uh, they're under consideration by the Office of Coast Survey and OMAO become part of our standard operations in the future. I think they will be contributing to this effort looking a little more than 10 years out. And through the efforts of OAR, specifically the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab, NOAA has been experimenting with sail drone. I think many people on this webinar are familiar with this type of vehicle. It's been getting a lot of coverage. And this is a company that owns and operates a wind and solar powered unmanned surface vehicle to make ocean and atmospheric observations. And has been recently used for increasing fishery stock assessment efforts. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. We've also been able to gain data from these systems that have been used on some of our hydrographic mapping products. So that, again, there's a lot of very interesting things going on 
not only with sail drone, but there's other similar, similar types of unmanned surface vehicles that are available uh, on the market. I wanted to talk a little bit about the buoyancy gliders. And through the NOAA Integrated Ocean Observing System program and our regional partners, we have a very formal program that uses buoyancy gliders to make and transmit observations in near real time. These platforms are part of an end-to-end -end integrated operation that includes deployment and operations, communications, and data management and dissemination. The information is crucial to understand and predict coastal events such as storms, wave heights, and sea level change. And buoyancy gliders are also being used to do things like the hypoxic zone monitoring that I talked about a little bit earlier. They can stay in the water for a long time and collect a lot of very valuable information. And of course, NOAA is using a variety of unmanned underwater vehicles, and they're proving especially adept at mapping and assessing extreme habitats, those difficult to survey areas that are high relief, where high resolution data is required to meet mission requirements. And when these systems are equipped with appropriate sensors and cameras, the vehicles are excellent platforms for searching for, identifying, and creating products such as photo mosaics of submerged cultural resources. I had a lot of experience with this during my time at the Ocean Exploration and Research Program. So I wanted to talk a little bit about remotely operated vehicles, and you may be asking yourself, why are they included? Because they are tethered to a ship and are manned in a certain sense by pilots. However, when you think about it, the complexities involved and the skills required to operate a vehicle that may be as much as eight kilometers beneath the bottom of a moving vessel in very dynamic conditions. It's similar to what one might one, uh, somebody might want to consider while operating a traditional unmanned system, uh, uh, piloting it using a joystick within line of sight of the, of the ship or from shore. Plus uh, remotely operated vehicles, they're particularly adept at collecting information that current unmanned systems cannot, such as samples, high definition video, and still imagery. Uh, data which is especially important to marine resource management efforts. And finally, these systems are also evolving, such as the Neriad under the ice. That's the image I have in the bottom there. This is a hybrid ROV that was developed and is operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which can function as an ROV when needed and can disconnect from its tether and operate in, under, in an underwater uh, vehicle mode. Uh, we did some of the pilot projects uh, with this vehicle up in the Arctic, some very fascinating work. We're equipped with the appropriate sonars. They developed some maps under the ice. So they were basically mapping the bottom topography of the ice and collecting additional information, including some, uh, some Im imagery, some video and still camera imagery of the species that we're associating with that very unique environment. So it's a, it's a fascinating vehicle. And I think we're gonna be seeing more of these hybrid types of vehicles come online. Uh, they work on sing single fiber optic cable. Uh, it's pretty amazing technology. And again, that's an institution that's uh, definitely been making a lot of progress in this regard. So I, I don't think I'll spend too much time on the next uh, series of slides here, but I did want to talk a little bit about um, the facilities that we have available. And I think it's important to convey that as we continue to increase our use of unmanned systems, we do have some shore-based facilities that we can rely on. So for example, within the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations where I work, we have the Aircraft Operations Center in Lakeland, Florida. And the staff that work there, in addition to doing the work with the hurricane hunters and the manned aircraft that they have uh, for doing other NOAA mission uh, requirements, they provide oversight and coordination of all NOAA unmanned aircraft operation and manned aircraft operation programs. They offer training, and in some instances, they also uh, get engaged with the field operations as well. So that's a growing capability that OMAO has through the facility in Lakeland, Florida. I think many of you may be familiar with the National Data Buoy Center down in Stennis, Mississippi. Um, they developed a years ago a centralized command center essentially to collect information that was being transmitted by the system of buoys we have. But this has also been modified now that it's part of this program I mentioned earlier with the Integrated Ocean Observing System Program. It functions as a centralized command center for the data and information that's being routed through Rutgers and then going out in near real time from the gliders that are deployed both in the Atlantic as well as the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. Um, NDBC, the Data Buoy Center, also has some, uh, some incredible facilities 
for, they were initially designed for doing the maintenance on the buoys, the fabricating buoys, but it's also now being used uh, to also work on unmanned vehicles as well. Uh, the Office of Coast Survey has moved their navigational response team down to Stennis, Mississippi to take advantage of these. So it is a pretty incredible facility if you are in the vicinity of Stennis and you have an opportunity to visit them. It definitely is, is worth checking out. Another facility that is very near and dear to my heart is in Davisville, Rhode Island. This is the home port facility for NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. And the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research has a very sophisticated deep submergent facility. It's dedicated to the maintenance of the dual remotely operated vehicle system that's currently installed and integrated on the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. And this shop is used to develop and not only maintain the, the vehicles that are associated with the Okeanos, but it's also used to develop other platforms and other sensors. Uh, the group that operates out of there, all, they also offer, offer training. So the facility is run in a very unique relationship with the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. This is a partner organization that designs and builds vehicles and sensors, and they, they manage and are at the forefront of telepresence technology. For those of you familiar with the Okeanos Explorer, this is the technology that enables shore-based scientists, managers, educators, students, and others to participate in missions conducted by the Okeanos Explorer in real time. And I know my friends in the program over there, not only do they do this on the Okeanos Explorer, but they're supporting the relationship with the Ocean Exploration Trust and the Exploration Vessel Nautilus that has a very similar mission profile. And they're building out towards some flyaway systems that could be used on other platforms. So that's pretty unique here, not only the facility, but the ability to combine remotely operated vehicles with telepresence communication technology is something that I think we're gonna be seeing more of in the future. And I think it's going to be adapted towards uh, integrating information uh, using unmanned systems as well. Uh, we actually, when I was over at the Ocean Exploration Research Program, uh, we did a project with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute using their under, underwater vehicle, the Sentry, where the people that were programming it to do the work off the south, uh, south coast of Georgia we're operating out of the University of Rhode Island. So it's the combination of these technologies, I think, that really makes things work and makes things very exciting. We'll talk a little bit about another partnership relationship we have with the University of New Hampshire. This is uh, run by the Office of Coast Survey. It's called the Joint Hydrographic Center. And this is a, an incredible facility here. It's a, an academic institution that provides for platform development as well as adapting and testing unmanned surface and subsurface vehicles, primarily for the purpose of hydrographic survey and mapping. They also, of course, offer undergraduate and graduate uh, level education to train the next generation of hydrographers, ocean app uh, mappers, engineers, and technicians. Again, that uh, relationship has it was started in 2001 and is going strong now in 2019. Um, and again, I capitalized on that when I was with the Ocean Exploration Research Program, and uh, it certainly has a, adds a lot of value. There's a lot of the next generation of engineers, technicians, and hydrographers that work for NOAA now that went through the programs up there involved in projects. Also, uh, just to mention, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the sail drone relationship with the Office of, uh, with the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab uh, in OAR. Um, this has been a long-term ongoing relationship uh, established through a CRADA, and uh, it's definitely been, it's, it's been working very well. In addition to developing the platforms and then modifying them, working in partnership with NOAA to adapt uh, sensors that can be outfitted on these to do different types of work. Um, they also engage in managing data and information and disseminating it from their facility in Alameda. So that's been a, it's been a very great relationship uh, has been working quite well. And again, that's why we've seen these types of platforms uh, quite easily adapt from our original mission, which was oceanographic and atmospheric operations to getting involved in work with specific sonars for doing fishery stock assessment, hydrographic mapping and other efforts. So uh, the aperture still is wide open to continue to do uh, this type of work and continue to evolve these systems very rapidly. 
Okay, so you may be asking yourself at this point right now, why unmanned systems? Why not just use traditional techniques, especially as it comes to operating and, and acquiring information in marine protected areas? And I think the key is to consider these as platforms that uh, represent another tool, another operational technique that complements and does not replace other platforms. So their ability to stay out longer, to work in very hostile and extreme environments, and to be deployed and left in remote locations for long periods of time provides for data sets that we're either currently not collecting or are very difficult to collect. To collect. Uh, we might not get otherwise. And these add to the body of information we need to meet our existing uh, as well as future mission requirements. So a little bit of the discussion now about um, unmanned systems and the relationship with MPAs. So I suspect that most of you listening to the webinar already have some experience with some of the unmanned systems that I've mentioned and are of course very well versed in requirements for appropriately managing MPAs, whether they're as large as the system of National Marine Monuments in the Pacific, the Pacific Marine National Monuments, or as small as the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of North Carolina. So in conjunction with traditional techniques and methods, unmanned systems have much to offer in terms of providing information for decision making, as well as increasing public awareness and engagement in helping us manage these areas. The technology itself can be an attractor. And from drones to small ROVs deployed based on open source designs, we're seeing more public activity in these areas. And through citizen scientist programs, we can capitalize on this growing interest. Uh, it is pretty incredible. We haven't seen Best Buy selling unmanned, or I'd say small ROVs or unmanned systems yet, but is that on the horizon? Quite possibly. Um, I know that uh, one of the organizations that we worked with, uh, basically a small group out in California called Open ROV, they designed and built an ROV, put the plans out uh, as open source, and for a small price, people are beginning to develop these small ROVs that can work down to 100 meters. And it's been fascinating watching how quickly that's evolving as well. And I know many people have been deploying those and using them in the National Marine Sanctuary Systems, a lot of them on the West Coast, collecting all sorts of interesting information. So the fly, following slides I have, uh, there are a couple of examples of how some current unmanned system activities could help with MPA management, and some of which I think maybe you have not considered before. Because I'm gonna start off with a, an interesting perspective, and this is kind of like from the global or large scale regional perspective. And this gets back to the discussion of gliders uh, and the integrated ocean observing system. Uh, there's been work done over the past couple of years to deploy these in the sense of a picket fence in the path of uh, where hurricanes are typically generated. And uh, they're being, they're being used to monitor conditions to track hurricane intensity. Um, as I'd say collect information that would be useful to better track hurricanes and better predict their, um, uh, their, their intensity. And I think this is information that is, if I put myself in the shoes of being an MPA manager or director, I, I'd definitely be paying attention to the information coming from these because it allows me to do the advanced planning what I needed to do to secure my assets in advance of these uh, types of events. But also more importantly, uh, in the advent of, uh, of a severe, significant uh, weather event, how do I start planning for damage assessment? How do I start planning for recovery activities uh, that I know are going to need to take place to uh, you know, again manage the resources that we have responsibility for? So it's pretty interesting. I do think this work that takes place that you might not often consider uh, associated with MPAs definitely has some bearing there. I wanted to talk a little bit more too about another regional effort and this has to do with a project that took place with the Southwest and the Northwest Fisheries Science Centers uh, last year. And again, this was using the sail drone technology. Uh, they have been running lines up and down the West Coast for quite some time gathering information to assist with stock assessments, to refine their stock assessment models, um, to again combine with data that they're getting from other sources. And uh, the, the sail drone technology enabled them to extend their lines inshore from where the ships have to stop working, where they can't uh, work as the waters get too shallow. 
So they came up with an excellent project design that allowed them to do that. And then up in the Northwest region where there was not ship time available, they ran the full lines offshore collecting all that data and information. And um, yeah, I think this, again, this information is definitely, uh, it's, it's of importance to people who are responsible for managing marine protected areas. And as you know, we have an extensive system of marine protected areas along the West Coast. So uh, again, these, these systems, what I often say to people is that the platforms themselves that we're using, the research is in determining how they are actually meeting our mission requirements because the platforms themselves are operational. Um, they, they are definitely being used, and I say the ones that we're using are being used in a very safe and efficient manner. So something I keep reminding myself of as we consider how to uh, improve our coordination of unmanned systems and make them, I'd say, more of a standard part of doing business in the future. A uh, couple comments on some sp site-specific activities. Um, this is a particular example of a public-private partnership that included the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, the Ocean Exploration Research Program, and Boeing, where they used one of their larger unmanned underwater vehicles um, to do a survey of the USS Independence, which is on the border of the Gulf of the Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary. And again, it, it was an excellent vehicle to use to do the type of work they were doing uh, to collect the information and to come up with the photo mosaics that uh, provide a really detailed view of the state of the shipwreck um, offshore there. So again, that's another application of these types of technologies. And then one, one last example, one that uh, I was involved with before I came over to the Office of Marine and Aviation Operations. This was a project uh, that involved um, the National Centers for Coastal and Ocean Science in NOS, the National Marine Sanctuary Program. I think people from both the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and the, Flor and the Flower Garden Banks uh, National Marine Sanctuary are involved, it involved uh, folks from fisheries. And it also involved two cooperative institutes, but it was a multi-partner, multi-year ecosystem connectivity study of this region called Pulley Ridge. Uh, it was a fascinating project and we were exploring how ocean currents, high relief habitat and water chemistry may influence the distribution of commercially and recreational important fish, spe fish species in and around the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And again, the fascinating thing about this is it truly was in a multi-year integrated operation where we were using ship deployed assets as well as a variety of small remotely operated vehicles and divers in the water to collect the information that really gave us a comprehensive view of what was going on. I think it's, a, it's kind of a mission profile that uh, definitely bears replication in other areas. Again, using a combination of technologies to gather, gather more information than you would otherwise. So I definitely see uh, opportunities for doing more of these operations in the future. So to close, a couple comments on looking ahead. I think we're definitely gonna see the use of these platforms continue to increase and increase almost exponentially. And we have to be prepared to increase our efforts to coordinate and manage them, recognizing that the data they collect often has broad application to multiple mission requirements. That example of sail drone, I think, is an excellent one where the folks at the Pacific Marine Environmental Lab recognize the opportunity to engage some other NOAA mission offices to continue to evolve the, the platform itself and the sensor suites that it carried. Uh, and again, to, in one mission, uh, accomplish a number of objectives. We also need to be prepared to more effectively evaluate and transition the most promising technologies to standard operations, whether they're NOAA-owned and operated uh, unmanned systems. I think there needs to be good reasons to do that, but we have to have a process in place that enables us to make those decisions appropriately or those that we use in a standard fashion that are better operated through external partnerships, whether it's through other federal agencies like our partners in the Navy or in industry. And I think we must be prepared for rethinking and supporting the skill sets of our future staff to take maximum advantage of these opportunities to make the best use of technology. And we have to be prepared for and will benefit from designing new missions like I just talked about these integrated types of missions. So all this needs to be done while considering the, the policies that are in place that manage this. We had an unmanned marine system symposium back in November down at Stennis, and we did invite our partners from the Office of General Counsel to come and talk to the community 
about um, the, the policies that uh, we need to be paying attention to and to determine whether or not these are going to be changing so we can stay out in front. But this is everything from policies associated with safe navigation to environmental policies such as NEPA. These are things that we have to be paying attention to. Uh, I think we also need to be very aware of and supportive of um, with our own internal capability to manage data and information. Uh, the ability to collect data with these types of instruments uh, definitely adds exponentially to the volume of data that's coming in house. And if we're not prepared to appropriately process, archive, and disseminate that information, uh, things can get complicated very fast. So that's where, again, uh, we had the folks who were responsible for these activities from the, uh, from the data archive centers in NOAA attend that symposium so they could talk about their planning and preparation for these types of events. And we also need to make sure that uh, as we build out, I'd say, more standard operations and we start better coordinating operations, uh, we definitely need to be cognizant of and aware of and planning for um, cybersecurity risks. You know, it is a changing world out there and with these instruments operating in a, a, an unmanned but controlled mode with pilots and programmers, or to truly automated uh, types of vehicles that are making decisions on their own through the integration of artificial intelligence, we need to be very aware and manage the risks associated with the flow of data and information that are being collected with these types of, these types of systems. So again, that was my closing side, and I'd like to again thank the MPA Center and sponsors for inviting me to talk with you today. And I definitely would like to thank uh, Joanne Flanders, who I worked with extensively in the past in a hallway conversation. She was the one who suggested I do this talk, and I'm glad even though we've been trying to get this off the ground for several months now, it finally happened. So with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, John. Um, so uh, before we get started with questions, uh, I'd like to uh, remind um, attendees and announce that the webinars are recorded as well as the discussion um, and the recordings will be available on the Open Channels website uh, usually within uh, just a few days and so um, I see that some people have sent in questions so I also would remind others that if you have questions please feel free to use the Q&A or the chat functions to send in your questions so we'll start with the first one here um, we have a a uh, question that says, I didn't hear you mention bot swarms or similar uh, type of, um, of uh, sampling. Do you have plans to experiment with this type of array to collect, say, current and oceanographic data? Um, I think that's a, an interesting question. I would say that, you know, right now, most of the research that we're seeing and experimenting with these types of systems, whether it's a, a specific type of platform, or whether it's thinking about swarm technology, those are quite often being generated by the programs themselves that are engaged in research. Uh, I would expect that, uh, you know, again, as we get better coordinated, you know, being having multiple people from multiple line offices and programs involved are gonna better enable us to evaluate that. But uh, we're seeing swarm technology used under a variety of uh, circumstances, uh, even for entertainment purposes like the last Olympics. I think we're going to be seeing more of that and we certainly should be keeping that in mind as as we proceed. Uh, it's not something that uh, that we want to ignore. Um, I know that at a somewhat higher level there's definitely efforts to be thinking about how to use I'd say not so much swarms but um, I say complements of more substantial uh, not bots but um, autonomous undersea vehicles uh, especially as it relates to doing mapping. Uh, so again, mapping extensive areas of the ocean floor, like for example, for um, meeting uh, some of the mission requirements we'd like to see happen in relation to the Seabed 2030 initiative. Okay, great, thank you. Um, another uh, question, um, and let's see, we say, the question is, um, are there organizations that offer comprehensive training in these unmanned systems? Um, I, 
training uh, training uh, definitely is an interesting issue and I, I think that what we're seeing is that uh, with our uh, partners in say the Department of Defense within the Navy there certainly is a lot of training associated with these types of systems that uh, they offer their own personnel we're seeing uh, training at academic institutions also you know I mentioned earlier the University of New Hampshire but we also have the University of Southern Mississippi that does have a training and certification program for unmanned systems that's been in operation now for several years. And uh, I know that there's no employees that have taken advantage of that. And that is certainly something that we're thinking of expanding on. Um, there are likewise other training and certification programs that industry offers as well that we haven't tapped into. Um, but I think we're, we're seeing more and more of these, these type of, I'd say, education uh, in the academic institutions as well as the federal institutions that operate these on a, I'd say, a very formal and very standardized basis. Okay, thanks for that. Um, let's see, another question here uh, is in reference to the survey of the independence that you mentioned with the Boeing uh, company. Um, do you know if there's uh, further collaboration with Boeing, uh, say, in the future planned, uh, for example, with their newer platforms, such as the extra large unmanned undersea vehicle Echo Voyager? Um, I would say that the, the best person to be talking to about that is probably Chris Beaverson. I don't know if he's li listening in on the webinar here. He is with the Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. He was the one that was uh, involved in that effort from that perspective. And uh, I, I, there was a couple of different tests of the system that they used for the independence. They had tried a preliminary survey of some difficult to survey habitat down in Southern California but he would be the best one to ask about, are there continued plans to investigate this type of technology? I know that Boeing definitely has been a good partner, not only in this, but as well as in other endeavors as well. Uh, we've had some of their engineers uh, working with us with remotely operated vehicles for doing work on the Okeanos Explorer as well. But I think Chris is definitely a good one to be talking to about additional plans that might be taking place there. All right, um, another question. Let's see, in the example of connectivity research in Florida, um, are there possibilities for um, international cooperation? For example, studying the connectivity with Florida and other places in the Caribbean, um, such as the Yucatan and Cuba. Um, and are there, um, are there plans to expand the study to other areas um, of the Caribbean, such as the Yucatan and Cuba? Not sure about the Yucatan and Cuba, but I know the National Centers for Coastal and Ocean Science, uh, they were the ones who envisioned this pulley rig project. They do have another project in play that is expanding it a bit further through the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and they get, definitely can be contacted for information on that. There was some follow-up work that was done using the same protocols and procedures that engaged the staff and my friends from the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary as well as uh, some of the marine scientists that work in Cuba, uh, that uh, work in marine protected areas associated with Cuba. That was done through a cooperative institute uh, that included Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. So there is a lot of ongoing work uh, thinking about how we can take the model that we use for Pulley Ridge and apply it more broadly. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I think some of this was stimulated by work that took place uh, decades ago as part of the old Sustainable Seas Expeditions projects. It was late 90s and early 2000s, where one of the major expeditions that was undertaken uh, did use manned submersibles, the deep worker submersibles that uh, were developed by Phil Newton, um, basically to um, work off Belize, Mexico, and off the Yucatan up to the Flower Garden Banks, and then around through the Florida Keys and up the East Coast, again, trying to look at connectivity between marine protected areas there. That, that stimulated a lot of thinking in this regard. So I think there's a lot more to offer there. The other thing about the Pulley Ridge project is I, and, and other similar efforts is it focuses, I'd say, on an ecosystem we know very little about in the Gulf of Mexico, which is the Meso, uh, Mesophota coral, coral zone. I'd say we have probably more information in hand on shallow water corals in that area, as well as the deep water corals, uh, but we have very little information on the mesophoto coral. So uh, I'm very pleased to see this, this work taking off. Okay, um, another uh, interesting question here. Um, 
how does one protect these unmanned um, systems on the water, say, for example, from, you know, um, unintentional or intentional run-ins by, well, unintentional by, say, recreational commercial vessels or perhaps intentional by uh, pirates? It really comes down to the uh, the operators themselves. Uh, you know, again, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about uh, sail drone, and uh, you know, again, they do they are able to gauge the environment around them. They uh, do sail with the sensors and, and equipment that allow them to understand where other traffic may be in relation to them. And you know, I think this really does apply primarily to to the surface uh, vehicles. But the surface vehicles that we're using also, are, I know the ones, the projects that uh, I am aware of and, and the ones that were mentioned at the symposium, some of them I talked about here, those are all operated through the guidance from the U.S. Coast Guard, um, what they call the coal regs. So there are navigational regulations whereby these systems are operated. Um, you know, the ability to, say, avoid piracy of some sort or vandalism um, you know, again, that's a, again, it, it's just a matter of understanding that you're having situational awareness of what's happening around you. I'd say on, again, it's primarily associated with the surface vehicles as opposed to the ones that work in deeper waters. Um, but again, it's, it's an area that we have to pay attention to moving forward, especially as we adopt these more of a, as a standard way of doing business. Uh, it's both, you know, operation, operating them in a, in a safe and effective manner as well as protecting them from um, possible vandalism as well as, uh, as well as piracy. All right, um, a little bit of a, somewhat of a related question here. Um, you, you know, you referenced unmanned um, vehicles, mm -hmm. um, but they require, uh, say, people to operate, maintain, and support. And say for the future, um, are there, is there work looking at improving, say, the technology to reduce that um, people to robot ratio, as well as even say ship time um, to support these, uh, these uh, sampling platforms? Um, absolutely. Um, again, but I think we're just really at the, uh, I'd say at the very beginnings of this, although it could evolve very rapidly. You know, the ability to start uh, integrating artificial intelligence where you're deploying a platform that based on what it's encountering, the information it's collecting, can make decisions on its own I think that's coming. That's really, truly an automated system where you, you deploy it in a region where you want to gather information, but you really have no command and control over it. It's making its own decisions. But I'd say that you know, most of what we're using right now does, it definitely requires people in the loop. And even in those systems that are truly automated using artificial intelligence, you, know, you always need the people that are planning the mission in advance, deploying the instruments, ultimately retrieving the instruments, even if it, it, that means deploying is swimming out of a shore base station and swimming back to it, and then working with the data and information, whether it comes, through a, comes back through a satellite connection or other means, there's always going to be a need, the need for people to be somehow in the loop, perhaps not in the navigational loop as improvements happen with artificial intelligence. But uh, unmanned, I'd say, is somewhat of a misnomer. And again, um, a lot of the systems right now are being operated, uh, they're either being programmed and they're, and they're deployed and they're being monitored as they operate, or they're being operated by joysticks. Um, and so, you know, I think there's always going to be a need for that. And plus, you know, I, I want to miss what I talked about earlier with the remotely operated vehicles either. I think there's, for the foreseeable future, there's going to continue to be the need to have a very specialized piece of technology like that. Uh, that can do a lot of work that unmanned systems currently can't do um, because of uh, power limitations and, and other other issues like that. All right, uh, let's see. A couple of questions uh, similar. The just um, if you might comment on what some of the costs are for uh, these kinds of systems. Oh, it certainly ranges. You can imagine something like the Global Hawk that um, I presented earlier. That um, that high altitude, uh, uh, very significant piece of machinery, you're talking about multiple, multiple millions of dollars. Whereas with the drones, you know, again, you're talking about uh, items that can be purchased at Best Buy. And you know, I'm, I'm wondering if I'm gonna start seeing them say at the local convenience store or 7-Eleven. Um, so the, the costs range widely. I think, you know, making decisions about what 
what the funding requirements are and what, uh, what investments should be made. It really comes down to understanding the mission requirements and understanding what are the best tools and techniques for collecting information that's going to meet that mission requirement. And that will help you make the appropriate decisions on you know, what's appropriate costs. I think there's another piece to this process as well. Um, you know, because in, in many ways I talked about how we're still doing research with these operational platforms. I think it's critical to not only do the evaluation of whether or not they're performing to meet the mission requirements, but to do the evaluation required to see if, the, if, they're, if they're cost effective, to do the evaluation to make sure that they're operationally effective as well. So it's not just putting them in the water, gathering data information, saying, did it meet my scientific objective? There's other components to evaluation that I think we need to be considering as well, and that we're beginning to see built into the uh, cruise instructions when we're using these types of platforms. All right, uh, you mentioned um, the evaluation process, and we had another question come in, um, and I think that the, in the talk, you discussed sort of partnerships uh, with, uh, uh, design and, and the question is, um, you know, does NOAA handle its own process um, for design, development of the prototype test and evaluation or is it sort of managed um, uh, outside of NOAA and uh, can you speak a little bit to that process? Well, I, I will also mention that uh, NOAA does have what they call the Unmanned Systems Executive Oversight Board. Again, this is a, a board that helps coordinate all the activities associated with unmanned systems. And I think that uh, applies to the, the question being asked. Um, you know, I think there, we have representatives from every line office on board and, and multiple programs. And I think everybody recognizes that uh, you know, NOAA is an agency that is, we're not DARPA. Um, we're not going out and building these, but we're relying basically on on uh, those partners that, uh, that are able to do that. I'd say we're harvesting technologies as they become available, leveraging the resources we have to make the best use of them uh, and seeing how they meet our mission requirements. Um, there will be situations, like I mentioned earlier, where a piece of equipment, a platform, delivers so well on all of those keys there, the ability to meet a mission requirement, uh, the ability to be deployed and operate in a safe and efficient manner, and it's delivering on multiple NOAA mission requirements or it's gathering data where we have a significant product line in mind that we want to have become part of our standard operation and we can be assessing the cost effectiveness of doing it that way. And I think a good example right now uh, is, you know, one of our strong product lines, of course, is the hydrographic products I talked about earlier. Um, as an agency, we own and operate uh, both the ships that gather hydrographic data as well as the launches that operate from those ships and collect data in near shore environments. And we have a strategy in place about how we're going to be converting that type of manned launch technology to unmanned systems to improve our ability to map the near shore environments. It certainly seems like an area where we would be considering um, basically owning and operating the, the best equipment available to enable us to meet that mission requirement. Again, it, all, it always comes back to what the mission requirement is. All right, um, let's see. A question has come in uh, regarding the, um, say the area around the uh, independence. And um, so the, the question is, um, you know, the data that are collected, are they stored in, uh, say, a, a type of repository um, and in that um, the individual's interested in how, how does one go about ac accessing, say, um, data that may have been collected in the vicinity, multi-beam, say, mapping data, um, et cetera? Is there, uh, is there a way to locate these data uh, easily? Well, well, NESDIS, uh, our line office, NESDIS, does, uh, they, that's where the data archive centers are housed. And they are responsible for archiving and making available. Most of this information is available online. I know in relation to the independence, again, that, that particular expedition was given coverage on the NOAA Ocean Explorer website. Uh, I would say more than likely there's a link to that in the um, Ocean Explorer Digital Atlas, which again was developed in partnership with, uh, with NESDIS. They were the ones who, who developed it to meet our requirement. 
uh, quite often when you go to that data, it's basically it's a GIS enabled data portal. It does provide you direct access to the archives where you can collect that data. Whether or not the data that was collected by Boeing there, I, I'm not sure, I haven't looked for it, but I know a lot of the data that's collected through the Ocean Exploration Research Program is available in this means, as well as uh, information collected by other NOAA programs using both uh, unmanned systems as well as traditional techniques. Uh, that's what the Data Archive Center's uh, mission is, is to uh, both archive and steward the data as well as to provide access to it. Okay, uh, and um, one question, say, in terms of, of uh, let's see, this semantics, I suppose. Uh, when we're talking about autonomous versus unmanned, are, are we talking about the same thing, or does autonomous, say, have a different meaning? It definitely has a different meaning, and uh, one of the things I didn't include in here, but there is um, a very, I'd say, very well put together table that I believe was developed by some of my uh, colleagues over in Coast Survey that uh, demonstrate how you actually move from a, an unmanned environment to a truly autonomous environment. So it, it isn't semantics, um, although people do use the terms in, interchangeably. Um, quite often people think of, um, uh, when they think of an underwater unmanned vehicle, they use the term AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle. But more often than not, the community is using the term UUV, unmanned underwater vehicle recognizing the, the role that people have in the, in the operational loop. Um, so there is a distinction there. Um, and again, that, that table they put together, which shows the progression from unmanned to truly autonomous, it's, it's a very well put together table. All right, uh, let's see. Another question um, regarding uh, advancements in satellite communications and if uh, you can comment on um, how advances in, in those communications say may change the dynamics of um, the data telemetry and communications with these unmanned systems. Um, will there be new capabilities uh, that that enables and then uh, whether cellular communications feature into these uh, types of systems? Well, I can only speak from my experience. And again, you know, we intentionally, when we did the conversion of the capable to NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer, uh, we always had in mind that we were going to have this telepresence capability. And essentially what you're talking about is just increasing, increasing the pipe. So you're creating a broadband communication capability that enables you to stream high definition video from a remotely operated vehicle about 6,000 meters below the ship to the ship, to a satellite, down to a shore base station, and then have it uh, basically decoded and then sent out uh, in close to real time, um, both through Internet 2 as well as uh, Internet 1. And, uh, you know, that definitely was a, was a game changer. Um, I talked a little bit about the experiment that we did with Woods Hole, where they used that same pipe to, uh, again, do the programming and make changes to how the AUV sentry, or I should say UUV sentry, was being used. I, it really is a matter of securing the satellite time and increasing the, the bandwidth available to uh, push as much data as possible. I think the applications are just going to continue to grow. I'd say that one of the most fascinating things about what we were able to do with the Okeanos Explorer is that up to that point before we started using the ship, we, we have a part of that program that is based on competitive proposals what we'd started doing with the ocean, with the Okeanos Explorer was a collaborative model where it was not based on competition, recognizing the value of having seen sometimes hundreds of scientists on shore contributing to the observations in real time because of that type of connection. So I think there's a, a lot of opportunity here. And I would think that also there, I'd say some lower cost options as well that would involve cell phone technology, uh, iridium and things like that. And quite often people have been doing things like this uh, regardless. And I mentioned the Sustainable Seas Expeditions back in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, that was very high profile. We were trying to basically engage uh, people in the expeditions as best we could at that time with the technology we had. And a lot of what we did there was just based on some very limited technologies we had on board the ships at the, at the time to communicate via email, phone calls, and things like that using uh, Iridium and cell phone technology at the time. 
wasn't real time presentation of, of uh, live video and things like that. But there are a lot of options that available out there right now. So I say from an MPA perspective, engage engage the public. But uh, you know, again, the more the more we see this, uh, what we're doing on like the Okeanos, uh, the more we see that being put in use. Um, you know, the cost will continue to go down. The more it's used, the, the more the cost will continue to go down. All right. Um, let's see. Another uh, question, say, it gets a little bit back at the, um, at the cost, uh, meaning are you able to elaborate a little bit more on, say, how the costs, uh, effectiveness of um, technologies such as sail drone are integrated into the, say, the cruise mission planning and the instructions um, uh, for particular missions? Um, I guess the best way to, to address that, I mean, it, it certainly is a, is a cost-effective platform with the business model that they have right now. Although, you know, again, it, there's still a lot of work to do to ensure that the, the vehicles and the way that they're being used, the way the data is being handled is being done in a, in a safe, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very safe manner, especially as, you know, when it comes to cybersecurity issues. But um, it, is a, it is a cost effective model because you can deploy a system like that. Say that you were going to be doing work in the Central Pacific and they deploy it from San Francisco. You're collecting data along the way as you get out to the operating area. And then you're basically collecting data and information 24 seven as it sails through the area. So it definitely is a, I'd say a very efficient and effective way for collecting certain types of data. Um, what I think of when I think of sail drone or any other unmanned technology, and this is why I keep on getting back to the point of augmentation, is that it will allow us to use our other tools, I'd say in a more effective manner. Uh, right now, I'd say that when we're looking at uh, NOAA ships, the UNOS fleet, and other platforms like that, quite often uh, we're being forced in terms of meeting a mission requirement to use them, I'd say, in a somewhat less cost-effective manner. Uh, when you send a ship out to, to, say, do service on the TAU array, the array of buoys that we have in the Pacific, uh, you have to ask yourself that question, is there a more economical way to do that, perhaps using unmanned systems, which is something I know people in NOAA are thinking about. And then you can start using your asset like the Ron Brown to do something else to start using. That's why I, I, I'm really excited about the integration of unmanned technology with traditional techniques. I get very frustrated when I start getting into conversations where people think that they're the answer to everything and they're gonna replace other techniques. And I think that's probably the most economically reasonable uh, way to proceed is be thinking about all the tools that we have at our disposal and be able to make the most effective use of them. Great, um, great uh, uh, thoughtful response there. Thank you. Um, so we're getting near the end. I'm just gonna say, put the call out. If there's any more questions uh, and you wanna submit, please de do so. Um, a comment here regarding a previous question um, that was looking for mapping data around the independence. Um, we have a, uh, an attendee that believes there was um, mapping, seafloor mapping and ROV survey done by the EV Nautilus. So I wanted to put that information out there. And then we have another um, question here that says, uh, facing the challenges with uh, diminishing budgets, um, is OMAO uh, working to highlight the use of this technology, say to inform um, our elected officials uh, regarding the value of supporting and enhancing funding for um, these types of capabilities. Um, there are most likely are many great stories, but say, are they uh, being, uh, say, effectively conveyed to decision makers? Uh, I would say that NOAA is effectively conveying those to decision makers. It's not just OMAO. Again, OMAO exists in partnership with the other NOAA line offices. And I think collectively, through a group like we have with the Unmanned Systems Executive Oversight Board, the appropriate messages are being sent, uh, again, within the constraints of the way we work with the Hill to convey these messages. To And, and again, what, I, what I'm really excited about right now is that at this point in time, we do have, even though with the budgets are limited, we do have a lot of champions, not only within NOAA, uh, with Admiral Gallaudet on board, and again, his experience is his, his breadth and depth of experience with the Navy. Um, but also we do have uh, champions within the Department of Commerce, uh, within the Office of Management and Budget, and of course on the Hill, 
I think people are recognizing that, uh, again, that uh, the, this type of technology is something that we have to continue to, to use, not only in terms of meeting our um, existing mission requirements, but all the work that we do, regardless of the technique, continues to amaze and surprise me because we're always, we're always uncovering something new that we can then translate into a future mission requirement. Again, we talked a little bit about deep corals. When I first started working with the Ocean Exploration Research Program uh, in 2001, deep corals weren't really on anybody's radar screen, neither was ocean acidification. So I think NOAA is doing a remarkable job of using all of our technologies to tell these types of stories and to hopefully secure the, uh, the resources that uh, we need to make progress. All right, um, so uh, we're at the end of our hour here, and um, so we've tried to address as many questions uh, as we could. Um, it's been a very thoughtful discussion, and uh, I want to thank John again uh, for sharing his work uh, and this information with us. Uh, John, any last thoughts or words? Uh, no, again, I'd just say thank you for the opportunity again. I, I know it took a while to get this off the ground. Uh, I'm glad that there seemed to be a very good turnout for this, and I, I certainly look forward to, again, continuing the discussion, working with many people who participated on this, on this webinar. Okay, great. Uh, and then I'll, I'll just um, include one last thing and that um, if there were a, uh, just a few uh, outstanding questions that we couldn't get to, uh, we will provide uh, the uh, uh, presenter um, with those questions um, just so that uh, he can see uh, what might have been outstanding. And, and I want to say thanks to everyone and that this concludes uh, the webinar. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.